Okay, so let, let's finish things up with a um, kind of interesting thing with the energy. So I, what I'd like to look at is like the energy per unit length of something. Uh, and I think we did a little bit of this with, um, with our original discussion about energy, but you, you know, students have a bit of a, a bit of trouble with this concept. So let's go ahead and look at it again. I think, um, I think it does deserve one of these little videos, uh, just, just because I, again, I've, I've noticed that students think this is a really weird idea and it's, it's really not, it's no different than the energy density. It's something that, um, is really useful to, to have going on, to have around. Um, so let's see what we can get if we uh, draw something out like this. Now, obviously I've already screwed that up a little bit, but that's okay because, uh, I mean, a drawing is just a drawing. It's to help you understand what's going on. It's not um, a geometric proof or not a geometric construction. Um, it's not a blueprint or a floor plan. It's not something that has to be directly one-to-one -one scale. And for this one, it's not really, it really can't be because we have, um, I'm going to say we have a very long um, capacitor. So, I, in, and in fact, I'll just go ahead and say that we have a um, infinitely long capacitor. Uh, that's a little different from my notes, but that's not going to do us any harm. Um, and so, in this case, instead of having, since this is um, a linear, these are linear, um, these are translationally um, symmetric, right? Uh, we should have lambda and minus lambda here for our um, charge, linear charge density. So we'll use that instead of the total charge. Now, if we had something that was a total length L, we'd still end up with lambda and minus lambda being the same, okay? And then we could find the total charge um, by multiplying by the length. So actually, let's... Let's do that. Let's say we have a length here, um, L, that's much, much longer than um, the radii of these things, which are going to be A and B. Um, and then we can find the total, we can find the total, total energy by finding the um, energy per unit length, okay? Um, which seems to me to be a pretty reasonable way to go about it, right? I mean, find the energy per unit length and then multiply by the length. I, good, it's good by me. So we have two long coaxial metal cylinders. All right. And they have uh, radii A and B and length L. We just said, right, length L. Oh, it didn't have to be L, it could be anything, but hey, L's a great letter for length. And they're connected to a battery, they're connected to a voltage source. And just like we said last time, we don't really need, well, actually in this case, we do need the battery, okay? Uh, because what we're going to look for uh, with the battery is um, the total energy, right? So we want to find uh, a, the energy per unit length. That's U prime. And then we want to find the total energy. Uh, U, all right. Um, and let's see. Our concept should be uh, energy in a capacitor. And our equation, um, U is equal to uh, what? Epsilon naught over two, no, one half CV, excuse me. Epsilon naught over two is for the field. So, one-half CV squared, okay? 
And if it's one half CV squared, that means that U prime is equal to one half C prime V squared. So we have a capacitance per unit length. So first to find our energy per unit length, we have to find a capacitance per unit length, which is again something that we looked at when we modeled the um, we modeled the coaxial cable in the uh, homework problem. So next, um, we had the concept. So now we, so now we're ready for our strategy. Okay. Um, so we've already we've already said that we'll assume uh, equal line charges. Uh, after that, we'll go ahead and find. Um, the field from Gauss's law. Okay, so we'll actually have to go ahead and do that. I don't think we've done the um, hollow cylinder in class yet. Um, and if we did, we did in one problem that nobody actually turned in. Um, three, uh, we want to find the voltage. And this we're going to have to do with the line interval this time. You know, last time we didn't have to do it with the line interval. We could get away with some some other way. I think this time we have to actually do the line interval. Um, and after we do that, we have to find, find C prime, right? And after we find C prime, we find U prime. And after we find U prime uh, below in the deep and darkest depths that you can't see, we'll find the total energy U or the energy U of the capacitor. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, so we have equal uh, uh, line charges, and so that's basically um, an integral around the uh, around the circumference of this thing times some sigma. So in this case, sigma A for the interior. And like I said, they're equal. So um, actually, I guess they're equal and opposite. So equals minus uh, two pi, you know, this one's minus, so this one's plus. It's equal to two pi B um, times sigma B. Okay, so that's just, uh, we'll use sigma B because these are sheets to find the field, all right? Simple enough. All right. Um, so in Gauss's law, the first thing we do is find the um, enclosed charge. All right. So let's see. If we have a hollow cylinder like this, then we've got two choices. If our Gaussian sphere, our Gaussian surface is on the inside like this, um, then we have zero, right? If our Gaussian surface is out here, there's no charge enclosed there because it's all on the interior of this tube, right? So now if this is outside our Gaussian surface, like this, then this whole region here, we add up the um, charge on the charge on this um, on this on this cylindrical shell. We add up each and each and every one of those rings for some length l, whatever that is, little l. Um, so that's a sigma, right? Times two pi. Um, a, 2 pi A, sigma A, right, times L. So that's equal, that's just equal to lambda times L. Right? So, so that's our um, total charge here. Um, and let's say we want to find our flux. All right, phi E. Uh, here it doesn't matter because on the inside 
we have no charge, enclosed charge, so we have, we're going to end up with no field. So on the outside is the only place where we really care about anything. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter really, because this is our, um, because the expression we get for the flux is the same in both cases. Uh, so the reason why we're using this cylindrical Gaussian surface is it matches the symmetry of our um, charged Gaussian thingy. Um, so then we just take the area of one of these um, faces which is pi r squared multiplied by L, and then that has our electric field in the r hat direction line, right? And then C, we um, do everything correctly. Q is equal to lambda L is equal to um, epsilon naught phi E, right? Uh, which means that um, that is equal to pi epsilon naught r squared l e r. Uh, these l's cancel, right? So we have um, lam e r is equal to lambda over pi epsilon naught r squared. So e is equal to lambda over pi epsilon naught. 1 over r squared. Okay, and that's in the r hat direction. It's going directly out here in cylindrical coordinates. For v, we just take the line integral from here, from this edge to that edge, of um, this electric field that we just found. So v is going to equal the integral from a to b of e dot um, dr, okay? Um, and so that's the integral from a to b of uh, lambda over pi epsilon naught one over r squared r hat dot um, r hat dr, right? So this is just a one. So our integral is from a to b. Uh, or let's pull out the constants, lambda over pi epsilon naught, right? So we have lambda over pi epsilon naught, um, integral a to b, r squared, dr. Um, and when we do that, uh, we get, no, one over r squared, excuse me. When we, when we do that, we get minus r, right? So minus b minus minus, minus 1 over b, minus minus 1 over a, um, and then we rationalize and all that other stuff, and we end up with lambda over pi epsilon naught um, times b minus a over a b. Uh, so not, not so hard so far. Uh, c prime then is just lambda over v, right? If c prime is just lambda over v, then we cancel that out. We have uh, the whole thing is pi epsilon naught a b over a minus b. Uh, fairly simple. u prime, we said, was equal to 1 half c prime v squared, um, which means we have pi epsilon naught over 2 a b over a minus b um, whoops, excuse me, a b over a minus b times b squared. So that's for part a, right? And so for part b, we have u is equal to u prime l, which is just equal to pi epsilon naught over 2, a b a minus b times l v squared. So that's for b. Nothing to it. So I think you're ready for um, whatever's going to come your way in the quiz. So talk to you soon. Bye now.